There is a, <clears throat> a fascinating phrase in Scripture uh, that uh, is used or is, um, uh, that the Bible uses uh, to describe God's direct and sovereign um, dealings or interaction with his people, uh, the Israelites. More times than not, this phrase is used in connection with uh, the plagues and Israel's deliverance out of, of Egypt. And the first time it's used is in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6, where uh, the Bible says, uh, God's talking to Moses, and he says, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. It's that phrase, outstretched arm, uh, with great acts of judgment. That phrase, outstretched arm, is often paired with other phrases like great acts of judgment or great power or great deeds and, and even the phrase signs and wonders uh, several times. On a couple of occasions, uh, one of them being the first verse uh, of chapter 6, uh, God uses the phrase strong hand or mighty hand and it seems to have the same meaning as this phrase outstretched arm. And on at least two occasions, Strong hand and outstretched armed are used together. One of those is, uh, those are in Psalm 136 and then Jeremiah chapter 32, which we will read uh, a little bit later here in just a, a couple minutes. But this image of God's outstretched arm, it becomes a, a recurring theme throughout the Old Testament. It's used 17 times. Uh, God mentions it. Uh, Moses mentions it. David mentions it. Solomon mentions it as long as, as well as Ezekiel and Jeremiah, two uh, prophets mention it as well. And it's an, an image that is intended to invoke God's power in terms that we could understand. But it's only understood or, or made visible through signs and wonders. Open your Bible to Jeremiah 32. <clears throat> Jeremiah 32, we're going to read verses 17 through 21. This is a, a prayer uh, of Jeremiah. In his prayer, he, he mentions uh, this uh, term out, or phrase, outstretched arm, and along with signs uh, and wonders. Starting in verse 17, he says, Ah, oh, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show steadfast love to thousands, but you repay the guilt of fathers to their children after them. O oh, great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord, that's the term Yahweh, remember when it's in all, all caps, that's his, his proper name, if you will. Lord of hosts, great in counsel and mighty indeed, <clears throat> whose eyes are open to all the ways of the children of man, rewarding each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. You have shown signs and wonders in the land of Egypt and to this day in Israel and among all mankind and have made a name for yourself as, the, as at this day. You brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror. So this, this word uh, sign it means witness or this idea of a witness, something that is evidence of a specific fact. Uh, or, and then, so it's just this idea of witness, something that, that testifies to something else, a spiritual reality or a fact of, of, of some kind. The word wonder gives the idea of a display of God's power. And so a sign and wonder, and, and they're used together a, a lot of times, these two words, is direct evidence that God is supreme, that he is who he is, that he is the God of all gods. He has no rival. There's no one like him. He is the supreme God of the universe. More specifically, they are proofs and, and evidence that God's power 
and presence is with his people, Israel. So when God says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, along with signs and wonders, God is telling his people that he is about to sovereignly and forcefully intervene in a very visible way that proves without excuse, it doesn't mean you can't deny it, uh, but without excuse, he is in fact the Lord. Nothing is too hard for him and his purposes cannot be stopped. So God's outstretched arm, along with this phrase signs and wonders, is, is very apparent and visible in the story or the account of the plagues and Israel's deliverance out of Egypt. So according to Jeremiah 32, in verse 21, the Lord brings Israel out of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong and outstretched arm, and with great terror. And we see that it's made visible in the ten plagues, uh, that Moses goes before Pharaoh, begins to tell him, here's what's going to happen if, if you don't let God's people go. They progressively get uh, a little worse and, and worse and worse until we get to the tenth plague, and we'll, we'll get to there in a minute. And so you have water turned uh, to blood, frogs, gnats, flies, death of livestock, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, uh, that the Bible says can be felt. I don't know what that's like, but it's terrifying. And then death of the firstborn. I think after the first one, I would have said, you're God, you're, you're right, we're, I'm done. Uh, you're, you, you, know, you can have your people, I don't, I don't need them anymore. Uh, I think I would have done that. But Pharaoh, being a very prideful and, and arrogant, uh, hard-hearted man, he does not see things that way because he views himself as God as well. And so what God does with the plagues is directly attack the Egyptian gods, Pharaoh, who believed himself to be a god. But we're not going to cover these ten plagues in, in, in detail. Um, I'm more interested in the why of the plagues, why they take place instead of what and what they are. And so we're going to look at, at, at the why. And so the purpose of the plagues is stated at least seven times within the narrative of the ten plagues. In Exodus uh, chapter 1 uh, through chapter 6, God is pictured as the God who hears. He hears the cry of his people, he hears their groans, he sees their misery, and he begins, he's ready to act. And then in chapter 7 through 12, the plagues, we see a God who uh, not just hears but, but works. He redeems and he delivers his people with an outstretched arm by his mighty and unsurpassed power and he directly asserts himself in the lives of his people. Look at Exodus chapter 7. We're going to read verses 3 through 5. This is God speaking. He says, But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. Now listen to verse 5. Here's, here's the purpose. Here's the why of the parables, or the parables, the plagues. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. God said the purpose of the plagues was so that the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh, that I am the Lord, that I am the I am. And God doesn't just deliver Israel. He delivers while judging his enemies. God simultaneously redeems while, uh, and br he brings justice. He redeems by defeating his enemies. That's a, that's a New Testament concept uh, as well. And so when God redeems, when Jesus redeems people, he does it by defeating sin in their life. But let's get back to the uh, matter at hand. He delivers his people by the force of his power, and he shows not only his people, but the Egyptians and he shows the world that he is the Lord. And there's no one else like him. No one else. Through the plagues, God definitively declares that he has 
no rivals. And he does this in a, a couple of different, it's all through the plagues, but it happens in, in a couple of different ways, if you will. So with the first three plagues, we have the, the water turned uh, to blood, we have frogs, and we have gnats. And it shows God's supremacy, that God is supreme, that he is sovereign, that he has all power, and he can do what he wants. He shows his power over Pharaoh, he displays his power over Pharaoh's magicians and the Egyptian gods. Well, we get to uh, the next set of three plagues. Plagues four uh, through six, the flies, death of the livestock, and the boils. Not only does God show that he is supreme, but that his power differentiates between his people and the Egyptians. The next three, uh, set of three plagues, uh, seven, uh, eight, and nine, the hell, locusts, and the darkness, not only does God show that his power is supreme, not only does his power, uh, he show that his power can differentiate between his people and the Egyptians, but it also devastates Egypt. The hell destroys everything it has left out in the field, livestock and plants. And anything that the hell does not destroy, we're told that the locusts destroy, that there's nothing green left in Egypt. And then the darkness comes, and it was thick, so thick that the Bible says it could be felt. And it absolutely paralyzes Egypt for three days. To the point that we're told that the people didn't even get out of their beds. They didn't even leave their places for three days. Then we have the tenth plague. And God gets Pharaoh's attention. Pharaoh, uh, he, he was witnessing everything up to this. Uh, he, you know, he, was, he saw everything. I find it fascinating uh, that you go to the second plague, the frogs, and, and they're everywhere. Do you remember? They're everywhere. They're in the people's beds, they're in their cupboards, they're opening up their ovens, and they're in their ovens, they're in their kneading bowls. They're, they're all over the place. I can't imagine. And, and Moses talks to Pharaoh and says, do you want me to relent? Uh, and, and Pharaoh very much says, eh, come back tomorrow. He chooses to allow the frogs to, to continue all over the land of Egypt. So, so none of these got Pharaoh's attention. But the tenth plague, the tenth plague gets his attention. It wasn't until the middle of the night that Pharaoh finds his firstborn dead. Along with everyone else in the land who did not use and take the blood over their, their doorpost. There was a loud cry in the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh finally relents. If Pharaoh would have listened, all of this would have been prevented. Because Moses tells him, if you don't do what God tells you to do, you will lose your firstborn. He tells him that. At the very beginning, look at Exodus 4 and verse 23. <clears throat> We'll do 21 through 23. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. He warns him. We looked at that this morning. God always warns. He warns Pharaoh and says, if you don't listen and you don't let my people go, here's the way this is going to end. And he didn't listen. And it ended exactly the way God said it was going to end. And God said all of this was done to get the attention of the Egyptians and the Israelites so that they may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Exodus 8 and verse 22. You know, when I read this account of Egypt and, and Pharaoh and, and the ten plagues, I can't help but think, how is God at work in my life trying to get my attention? What's God doing to get my attention? 
Is God getting my attention? How has God intervened in my life through people, through events, through um, situations to get my attention so that I will listen to him, so I will acknowledge him, so I will, will see that he's trying to work in my life and accomplish something that maybe I'm trying to not listen to or that I'm trying to say no to. Doesn't God do that? God works. God is still at work in our life. And everything that God does is meant to soften our heart and draw us to him. Paul writes to the church at Rome and he tells them such. Look at, at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. He writes to the church at, at Rome and he is telling them how God is at work. He says, Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Th that, that, that passage right there ought to take our mind back to the plagues. And, and, and Pharaoh and how God was trying to get his attention, but Pharaoh wasn't listening. He was letting his heart be hard and, and, and impenitent, and he wasn't listening to God when God was working to get his attention. What Paul is saying to the church in Rome and to us, all good things that God gives and that God does is meant to draw us closer to him. And he says, Virtually the same thing, but in a, in a different way. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verses 8 and 9. It is 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, Paul says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Everything we experience, whether it is a blessing or a burden, God is trying to get our attention so that we will know that He is God, that He is Lord. And so the question is, does God have our attention? Are we looking for Him? God is at work in our life every single day, Sometimes, well, a lot of times, I think, we're just not looking. We're not allowing him to get our attention. The Lord has given us signs to get our attention and draw us to him. Look at John chapter 20. John chapter 20. <clears throat> Verse 30. In 31, John says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which were not written in this book, but these were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. God has given us signs. And He has had them recorded for us so that as we read, he can grab our attention and draw us to him by faith. And the greatest sign that God has ever given wasn't the plagues, wasn't creation, wasn't Noah and the flood. You know what it was? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the greatest sign ever given. Look at Acts chapter 2. We can do a little reading this evening. 
Acts 2, this is uh, Peter uh, preaching. <clears throat> Wish we could read the whole thing, but, but we're not. But we are going to do a little bit of a, a lengthy reading. Starting in verse uh, 22. Peter says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Let flesh also, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul in Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me uh, full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn him an oath uh, to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out uh, this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you've crucified. Referring to Jesus, Paul says this in, in Romans 1 verses 3 and 4. Concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The purpose of the plagues and the exodus is the same purpose of creation, which is the same purpose of the resurrection and our redemption. It's the same purpose of the new heavens and the new earth to come. It all demonstrates the supremacy of God and that he is Lord. It's pointing us to him that we may know, that the world may know, that he is Lord. Nothing is more awesome than the glory of the Lord. No one is worthy of honor. No one is worthy of worship and obedience rather than the Lord. No one. The aim of everything that we read about here in Scripture, every sign, every wonder, everything God has ever done is to get our attention and point to Him as Lord so that we may bow down and worship Him and give Him honor and praise and glory forever and ever. Amen. That's the purpose and the end goal of each one of our individual lives. Because, as Paul tells us uh, in Colossians 1 and verse 18, that Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. He's preeminent. He's supreme. He has no rival. There's no one else like him. He is Lord of all. And at the judgment, we will witness the preeminence and the supremacy of Jesus. We will witness the differentiating nature of his power as he separates the sheep from the goats, as he differentiates between Israel and Egypt in the plagues. We will witness the devastating nature of his power as the righteous are cast into the eternal lake of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and his people will be ushered into glory. Is Jesus preeminent in your life? 
Is he first place? Does he outrank everything else in your life? Is he the first choice in everything that you do? Is pursuing him your top priority? Is your life about Jesus Christ the Lord? Because everything that God has ever done since creation is about getting your attention. The good things get your attention. The bad things can get our attention. You know, Paul tells us that God works everything for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Does He have your attention? Tonight, we give the opportunity to put God first, to make Jesus your Lord by putting your faith and your trust in Him and nothing else. Not in yourself, not in your ability, not in someone else, not in someone else's ability, not in anything else except Jesus and Jesus alone, and He will save you. And you can do that by repenting of your sins, turning from yourself, turning from others, turning from, from anything in your life that distracts you from Jesus. Being immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Receive the Holy Spirit. Raised to walk a new life. A new creation. Recreated in the image of Jesus. Maybe you've already done that. Maybe you've already done that, but there's other things that have gotten your attention. And you've walked away or, you, or you're beginning to see a, uh, you know, a, a disconnect between you and, and Jesus and the relationship that you have with Him, you can make that right with Him tonight. Whatever your need is, please come forward while we stand and while we sing.